Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Carrie Culp. She's the founder and director of Painted Dog Research Trust USA. She fell in love with African painted dogs after reading about them in a book she found in her elementary school library. She is a FGASA certified level one field guide, safari guide, trained in South Africa in Karangwe Game Reserve, and enjoys sharing her passion for African wildlife on trips to Africa, as well as at home in Seattle, Washington. So first, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. I appreciate it. So who are, who are wild dogs? So wild dogs are the second most endangered canid in Africa. Um, they are actually on a different branch of the dog family tree from, say, our wolves, foxes, domestic dogs. And the nice thing about that for them is that there is no chance of mixing domestic dog genetics with African wild dogs. So that's a good thing. Um, but basically, they uh, evolved and, uh, from about six million years ago, and they um, are cl- most closely related to an Indian wild dog called the Dole, which is D-H-O-L-E, and the South American bush dog. So um, in their early days, there were probably about a half a million animals across most of sub-Saharan Africa, so that would have been about 39 countries. And today, the estimates are somewhere between four and 6,000 animals across, let's say generously, nine to 14 countries. So you can see a tremendous decline in their population. And that comes from a number of things. Um, One that I think we can all understand here in North America is sort of the unfounded hatred and fear that our North American wolves face is something that um, painted dogs also face. And they have a little bit more to it. Um, They have a different way of killing their prey than, say, other predators that we're used to. Um, What they do is they catch their prey and they immediately disembowel them. Um, When I first went to Africa, I was told that that would be too gory for me as an American and that I couldn't handle seeing people. But in 2000, let's see, what was that, 2008, I saw my first kill. And I have to tell you, it's a lot quicker and less gory than the lion kills that I've seen. Um, It's very, very fast. In fact, the dogs, because of their small size, have to pretty much kill and eat their meal in about five minutes because otherwise they'd be unable to protect that against, say, lions or hyenas or some other animal that would like to take that that kill. Um, They also happen to be way more successful as hunters than most other predators. So if you think of a lion maybe being 33% successful on their hunts, compare that to African wild dogs, they're probably in the 75 to 90% success rate. So um, that's that's pretty different. Um, but I think the reason that, that African wild dogs have always been so special to me is the fact of sort of the, the paradox of that. People thought that they were evil killers and all that kind of thing, but really they are probably the most protective of their pack of any animal that I can think of, um, even more so than wolves. So let's say that an animal is injured in a hunt, breaks a leg, something like that happens to them, which happens fairly commonly. The pack will actually set the dog somewhere where they can care for them. They'll go out and hunt, and then they'll come back, and they will actually feed the dog, take care of the wounds, and most of these animals actually survive. So I think the the thing that's just so fascinating about them is how each member of the pack has a real role in the pack and real importance to the pack, and that they will fight and do anything they possibly can to keep them all alive. And so I think that's kind of counter to their reputation, certainly, and then also to sort of the way that a lot of people view animals in general where survival of the and and it says on the um painted dog research trust uh website also that elderly animals are taken care of in the same way 
That is true. So if let's say that we have an alpha male and female, and um, alpha doesn't mean dominant, alpha means leader. So um, there is complete fairness within the pack, but they're, they're, the pack will pick leaders. And so it's more for their um, intelligence, their courage, their you know character, I guess you would say. Um, but basically, yes. Yeah, so when say that those animals, you know, pass their prime, the alpha pair are the ones typically who are the only ones mating. The 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 pack will have them along for as long as they're alive, and you know will take care of them even if they can't hunt. Um, snares are something that affect a lot of African painted dogs, not because people set snares for painted dogs but people set snares for bushmeat and they're able to gather a lot of wire out of their environment so they can create hundreds of snares. They'll lay them all out trying to catch bushmeat, which is another poaching trade. And when one dog gets snared, then a number of other dogs will come in to try to help that dog and likely get snared too. Um, often the snares happen around the neck or the body, but sometimes they happen on a leg and so there was a a dog in Zambia who ran with the pack for at least a couple years who had only two legs. Um, so opposite, one right um, front and one left rear. And ran with the pack for, like I said, quite a long time um, because the pack was willing to feed it. So it could keep up, but it couldn't hunt. And so the pack actually cared for it of course, it all, the pack also had to care for it through the healing of the legs that were snared basically off, and so or that were chewed off. And so, uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of care that comes from the pack and takes care of any animal that is with them for the duration of their lifetime. And it also said that sometimes there is a doctor dog who is assigned as as specific as a caretaker, mm -hmm. and that's pretty that's pretty cool too. It is pretty cool. Um, one of one of the researchers who works in Zimbabwe uh, had just started studying painted dogs, and you know there was still some mystery around them. This was about 28 years ago, um, and so he had heard some lions, and he went out and he found this pack of dogs that had been fighting with the lions, and he found this one dog, and it was it was really pretty badly injured. And he called a vet because he didn't know what else to do. And, you know, in the bush, the vet doesn't come in five minutes. They come in maybe three days. And and at that point, the vet said, oh, this dog is, is gone. It's, it's natural. Just let it go. And so the next day, I guess he came back and the dog was gone. And then following that, he started to notice that the pack was kind of not not moving as far as they usually do. And he found out that they were caring for this dog and that the dog eventually was fine and moved on with the pack. So it, it really is um, very inspiring and sort of ant against, I guess, some of the things that we learn about animals, just sort of survival of the fittest. If you can't make it, then you're done. So in a moment, let's talk about threats to the dog. But I would like to back up for a second and... Um, can you talk more about just physically, you've said they're small, but can you say like how small and um, what do they look like and how many members are in a pack? Just give us some basics on their, their physicality. Sure. Um, so a pack could be as small as two. That, that would be a um, fairly sort of stressful population situation. Uh, but they can get being about 20 to 24 dogs before they start to disperse. And that would usually be maybe 10 to 12 adults with pups. Um, so they need to be able to feed themselves, and they can hunt up to twice a day. So when the pack gets bigger than that, then obviously they need to break. Um, they are a very long-legged species. Um, I, I suppose you could say that of wolves as well. And I want to get back to leg lengths a little later, but um, but they're also fairly thin. So if you think of sort of a thin German Shepherd, that would be maybe about the right body size. And then um, 
one of their sort of telltale characteristics is their very, very large ears. Um, that is in part for communication, of course, but it's also in part for hunting. So the dogs can travel up to 25 miles at a time looking for or hunting prey. And so um, in Africa, in a hot climate like that, the ability to cool themselves is really important, and that's one of the roles that their ears play. So they have a coat that's three colors, so um, black and sort of a reddish brown and white. And each one has a unique coat pattern, sort of like a zebra would have a unique pattern. Um, and this is often the way that people can identify them when they're researching them. So there might be a couple of spots on the shoulder or some other identifying characteristic within the coat pattern. But each one is unique. Um, and are they... Um... I mean, the, for one thing, I mean, when I look at pictures of them, they're, they're beautiful, beautiful animals. Um, and then, can you talk about um, who they eat and who are their their major prey? I mean, it seems like they don't really go for rabbits; they go for bigger creatures. And then also talk about the um, the way pups are taught with with um, chasing non prey animals. Okay, sure. So uh, what they eat depends a little bit on where they are. So if you were in Tanzania, Kenya, for example, they might eat like Thompson's gazelles um, and also larger antelope, even up to the sort of the size of wildebeest. If you were in Southern Africa, you'd be looking at impala, kudu, um, again, possibly wildebeest, although it would have to be sort of a straggler or a young one. Um, so the, their main their main prey is antelope from the sort of impala size up to the sort of kudu size, which is a larger spiral horn, horned antelope. Um, and they have some issues, as I mentioned, with defending their kills. So their, their two main enemies, if you will, in that, in that scenario are hyenas who often follow them around. Um, because they're such successful hunters that, you know, they might get a great meal. Um, roughly uh, twice the number of dogs has to be present as hyenas to be able to defend the kill from them. Um, but they're very, very coordinated in their efforts, and so um, it's almost like somebody says go, and all the dogs do their thing at once. It's, it's really interesting to watch. Um, the other kind of animal that is maybe even more of a problem in some ways are lions. Um, not only would they steal the prey of a, of a wild dog, but they would also like to um, kill their babies if possible. And so that is another issue also with hyenas too. Um, and and something I thought was really interesting was, <clears throat> excuse me, about um, uh, two things actually. One is that I thought it was really interesting that uh, the pups are given the first dibs on food, and the other is is that they that the pups are taught to to or they do sort of it looks it sounded to me I, I read a little bit about it play hunting almost um, of non prey species was am I reading that correctly? Yeah, you are, and so yeah, so the pups of course at first are drinking milk, but pretty soon they are going to be eating food. And these are truly carnivorous carnivores. They don't really eat anything else. So when the adults come back, um, in the beginning, they actually regurgitate food for the pups in little kind of packets so that each pup gets a certain amount of food. And this needs to be done quite often. As they grow up, then if the hunt is close enough to someplace where the, the pups are, they will come and actually get the best food. Um, they get the, the pick, they get to eat first. But they're taught to be submissive, and so submissive behavior sort of gives them the right to go in then and get the food, and that's training them to work within the pack setting. Hmm. Um, the other thing that they do then later as the pups are starting to learn to hunt is they will pick a non-target species, so something that you know, none of them are ever probably going to get. Um, I have some images of uh, the alpha male teaching the pups 
how to hunt with three very large wildebeest. And what would happen is the pups would try chasing the wildebeest, and then eventually the wildebeest would chase the pups, and then the pups would chase the wildebeest again. But in this way, they don't risk losing a real meal, and they teach the pups te techniques in hunting and working together because the reason they're su such successful hunters, of course, is that they're so cooperative. This is all just, I think, incredibly fascinating stuff. Um, can we can we sort of transition now to... Uh, you talked about a previous population of, I think you said a half million, didn't you? I mean, half, I, yes. And in what time scale is that uh, decline from a half million down to three to 5,000? I can't speak to that directly, but what I can tell you is that about 40 years ago, they were classified as vulnerable on the IUCN rating system. And then, you know, today, now, and for probably 20 years, they've been classified as um, endangered. And of course, if I could add highly endangered, though that is not a designation from IUCN. So who, what, why, 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 why the collapse? Okay, so the, 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 the main factors will differ slightly depending on where you are in Africa. Um, there was a time in Namibia where, not so long ago, actually in the 60s, where paint dogs and bushmen were legally be able to be shot in whatever quantity at whatever time anyone wanted to. So um, I think the initial problem started uh, much like our problem with, with people's perception of wolves. Um, people thought that they were going to get their livestock, so they were afraid for that. And then to add to that, we had the idea that they were evil because of the way they killed. In fact, the term Africa, well, so when I was a kid, they were called Cape hunting dogs. And then they started to be called African wild dogs, which sounds sort of feral and like, well, who would care about those? And so there's been a rebranding effort to go back to their genus and species, which roughly translated is um, painted wolf-like animal. And so that's why the painted dog terminology has come back into play. Um, so I think that rebranding has helped them a bit in some places. So that's sort of the initial cause of the issues. But then another thing that started to happen was that the, you know, people used to set snares made out of grass to catch their meal. Um, but once fencing became more popular throughout Africa, then all of that material was fair game for making much more durable, much larger snares, and much more, many more of them. So a sort of a new site type of poaching occurred where, you know, a lot of snares would be set, and then the people who were looking for bushmeat would come back and take what they wanted and sort of leave the rest. And so... As I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the dogs being so cooperative, you know, if a dog is snared, the other ones will go in to try to help, and now they're in a field of hundreds of snares, and it's sometimes possible that the entire pack might get killed, or that maybe one of the adults is back at the den with the pups, and the rest of the pack gets killed, and now that one adult is responsible for feeding, you know, five to 12 pups. So the snares have become a huge, huge issue. Um, and remind me, please, to tell you about one way that we're trying to move snakes from the environment. But following up with other other things that affect them, of course, diseases like rabies and distemper, which are transmitted from other wild animals or from domestic dogs, too, is still a big problem. And then, of course, they face all of the other sort of threats that most other African wildlife face, so destruction of habitat, proximity to people, um, and kind of all of the things that are happening to wildlife around the world. So I think as all of those pressures have sort of um, teamed up, it, it has uh, created a decline in population that, that really sped up from probably the 60s to now. I, I recently interviewed someone about giraffes, and one of the... And then giraffes, of course, are getting hammered, just like almost everybody's getting hammered. And one of the, the, the fairly positive things that they, that they said about that is that in the case of giraffes, there are actually some areas with decent habitat from, from where the 
giraffes had been eradicated through other means, which means that there is some decent habitat to put them back into. Mm -hmm. So are, are the painted dogs, is their primary constraint the direct assaults on them and the diseases, or are the primary constraints the lack of habitat and prey species? I, you see what I'm trying to get at? I do. So, um, you know, some, it, and again, it depends a little bit on what part of Africa you're talking about. Um, the snares have been pretty detrimental lately, and then den dispar- disturbance, which I haven't gone into yet, is another issue. Um, so there is land. There is a trans frontier park that is attempting to create linked habitat because linked habitat is what is important. If you have fragmented habitat, when the dogs disperse, they can't find other dogs to create a pack with, or they're finding dogs that are too closely related to them and you get inbreeding. So there is a trans frontier park that is sort of being established where Zimbabwe is, if you can imagine, sort of in the middle, and then you've got South Africa, the Caprivi Strip of Namibia, you've got Zambia, you've got Mozambique, you've got a little bit of Angola, as we're finding out, and certainly Botswana is a stronghold for them. Um, so you've got this linked area now that where they're trying to keep wildlife corridors intact so that the animals can actually disperse and meet new bean pools so that they're not becoming inbred because, of course, that's another problem that a lot of animals face when faced with fencing and cut, you know, cutoffs to their migration routes and that sort of thing. Um, lions face the same thing. Then, you know, they've got these fragmented populations that can't reach each other, and so the, genetic, the genetics can't get mixed up. Um, that's a problem. I also wanted to bring up den disturbance. Um, so, like anything, when it gets popular, people want to see it, and a lot of the safari operators started using African wild dogs in their literature. And so you didn't know what they were. You probably think they were pretty cool looking and you might want to see one. And the easiest way to see them is to take you to a den because that's the only time that the dogs aren't moving. They actually cover a 600 square mile home range. So they are moving about quite a bit except when they're denning. And so who wouldn't want to see a cute painted dog pup? And what guide wouldn't like a good tip? So the some guides, irresponsible guides, will drive you right in so you can see the denning site. The problem with that for dogs is that then, as I mentioned, these pups need to eat every couple hours, but the adults don't feel comfortable coming back to feed them, so they're missing meals. Also, what's happening as these vehicles drive into these dens every day is that they're opening up what probably would have been a pretty closed, um, kind of scrubby bush area and so now lions can get in, in more easily, too. So this is resulting in a lot of dog mortality, pup mortality in particular, and then also in a new phenomenon, which is just currently being studied, which is that these pups, due to the lack of nutrition, are ending up with leg lengths that are about a quarter to a third shorter than what they would have if they got all the nutrition that they needed. And so that, of course, makes it more difficult for them to hunt, to, you know, run for longer distances. It's a phenomenon that we also see in captive dogs, in zoos, for example. Um, if you compared a, a, an animal that was bred in a zoo with an animal that was bred in perfect conditions in the wild, you would notice a real difference in the, the height of their legs. And so the den disturbance is kind of a new issue, but it's it's a very serious one. So now that people know what they are and kind of love them and want to see them, then that presents some new challenges. So um, let's let's back up a second and talk about dispersal. So so I am or you are a a pup, uh-huh. and then you at first are feeding from your mother, and then after that you are. Uh, getting regurgitated food, and then after that you are um, go on the, the 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 play hunts, and then what what happens after that? Do 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 any of them stick with the pack for their whole life, or 
or do they all disperse? Do they disperse singly? Do they go off in little groups of three? How, what, what happens? So some may stick with the pack, depending on the size of the pack and, and all of that. So what happens with the pups is that they actually start to, their personalities start to develop. And the pups will actually sort of select who is the dominant. And it's not really dominant, but who is the alpha. So who would be their leader? Who has the skill set to be a leader? And then if they were to disperse, let's say it was three brothers, they would disperse by gender. So uh, let's say it was three brothers. One of those brothers would likely be the alpha, and the other two wouldn't. But they would join up with, say, a group of dispersed females, provided that the the female is the chooser, provided that she finds that alpha male to be her ideal mate. And she might take quite some time, in a natural setting anyway, she might take quite some time deciding who that perfect alpha is. So she might check out one one alpha male with a couple of his brothers and then check out another alpha male with a couple of his brothers and then decide from there who she thinks will be, you know, her best selection for a mate. And it really isn't about size or strength. Um, I've seen some really tiny alpha males, but, you know, she decides who she, th who she thinks will carry her bloodline through. And so, of course, that's probably not what she's thinking, but that is the case. Um, so that's how they disperse. And so, of course, if they can only get to other animals that are related to their own pack, then, then you're starting to see things like floppy ears or similar markings or, you know, very um, unarticulated coats. And so then people have started to get really concerned about inbreeding when they see those sort of indicators. So you said earlier that they have a 600-mile range, so, so 20 by 30, say. Mm -hmm. um, um, and do their ranges, let's, let's pretend that it's a healthy population and they're not, they're not being stressed with snares and everything else. Mm -hmm. would, would, that pop, would that range be fairly... Would that would that be a home range that would stay consistent over years? And then would there be and then how when they disperse, do they move to a separate range or do they share the range for a while? I think about this a lot because where I live um, in far northern California, we see bears every day, mm -hmm. and it's the it's the mother bears. It, interesting, I didn't know any of this until I lived here, and it's the mother bears who ha who, who will have a home range. And the males basically can just, they just sort of free float. The females will stay here, and if there's another female comes around, they will, um, they can sometimes share, but they're not usually very happy about it. So I'm, I'm just wondering about how the ranges work. Do you see what I'm asking about this? I do. I think of it as like a giant um, set of Venn diagrams, right? So kind of the heart of the range, I mean, they can't defend a 600 square mile range, so they... Um, you know, they, they can probably defend portions of it. Animals will definitely, other, other painted dogs will definitely pass through. They'll try to avoid each other because if they don't avoid each other, they could fight. Um, the two packs, that is. So they sort of try to avoid each other and they know, I mean, they can sense from, you know, maybe even a day or two before that another group is in the pack. Um, there is a researcher in, his name is Tico McNutt, he's actually from Seattle originally, and he runs the Botswana Carnivore Project. And um, he has been working on a synthetic hormone that he could use to mark territory, but what he wants to do is use it to mark human territory to keep the dogs out. So as they scent mark, then... Um, you know, other dogs will sort of try to stay away. Um, so he would scent mark a place where he knew there was a ton of snares or something. Yeah, a ton of snares or a community that wasn't friendly toward dogs or, you know, a community that had lots of livestock or something like that. And so um, this has been something that he's been trying to develop to sort of minimize human wildlife conflict. So is, is the... Um are the attempts to rebrand painted dogs uh, working in terms of 
is the um, antipathy that you that you said that that some people would have toward them is that is that diminishing at all? I think it is, um, I, and I think it is for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, there there have been studies where you know people thought that it was painted dogs that killed their livestock, and it was proven that it was not. Um, they really won't go after livestock unless it's kind of a last resort. But I think the real the real story is about um, it's all about education, really. So there are a number of organizations that have reached out to local communities to really educate them, but even more so their kids, um, about all wildlife, including painted dogs, of course, and um, have really sort of had far-reaching um, results with the community based on the community understanding that, you know, with painted dogs comes some benefits, like maybe, you know, health care or education for their kids. Um, there are a lot of um, organizations that either do sort of educational outreach or actually create um, bush camps for kids where they come for a week and learn about wildlife and get to go out on safari, which, as odd as it sounds, is something they never actually get to do, um, and kind of see the wildlife for their positive aspects instead of kind of maybe as you might experience them living with them or not seeing them but having heard of them. Um, so I think it's a lot about education. It's a lot about involving local people in conservation because so often in the past it's been someone from Europe or America coming over and, and conserving them and it's not coming from inside the country. So I think there's a really big effort to train kids inside the country. Um, there's another gentleman named Dr. Greg Rasmussen. He originally founded a organization called Painted Dog Research, which became um, Painted Dog Conservation. They have a big bush camp, and they take all um, of the surrounding kids at like sixth grade level and give them a week in the bush, a lot of fun. Um, they learn a lot, and they're really trying to um, start kids young to sort of learn about conservation and become involved and excited about it. And then he's now gone on to establish Painted Dog Research Trust in Zimbabwe, which is taking lo uh, local graduate students, so people at university, and giving them a campus where they can get their field conservation experience so that they can go off and have careers in conservation. Hopefully, some would stay, obviously, with painted dogs, but you know, conservation of animals in their own country, so that they're really starting to take control of that themselves. And I think that's really important, um, seeing, seeing the benefit of living with wildlife um, is, is really important for local people. And is the... <coughs> um, Earlier, when you were talking about snares, you one of the questions I was going to ask is, so are they basically, to use the U.S. military term, collateral damage primarily with snares, or is anybody trying to snare them intentionally? No, it's all collateral damage. Um, there was something, I didn't quite understand what you said, but you wanted me to remind you something when we were talking about the traps. You said, remind me of... So there's a program now where um, they're collecting that snare wire out of the environment and creating animal sculptures with it. So um, they might make, you know, giraffes or, or elephants or whatever, but there's also a number of painted dog um, snare art pieces out there too. And so the idea is to take a negative and create a positive in a piece of art, employ someone to make that piece of art, and then also by selling that piece of art to someone, you're taking it out of circulation for future snare use. Um, there's actually all kinds of snares. There's even snares set for elephants, and so that would be obviously a different grade of wire. Um, a local artist here named Colleen Cody made me a sculpture using snare wire and some other wire recently. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of really lovely things being made out of it to try to remove it from the environment and not allow it to be, you know, used for snares anymore. 
there's also a new program where um, they're, the artists are being paid double if they will go collect the snare themselves and then make the art. And so that way, you know, a lot more people are vigilant about collecting the snare wire and its value as not a snare, basically. So um, it's it's an interesting program, and um, it's some of that snare is actually even being, or the snare art is actually being sold now in in zoos around our country too. So we have about ten minutes left, and before we start winding down, there's another direction I'd like to go for a second, and I don't have any idea if if this is in your area of expertise or not. Um, prior to, do we know what the relationship was? across different places between the traditional indigenous people and the painted dogs prior prior to conquest at all did they have did they have did they play a role in their mythologies do we do we know much about that i don't know much about that i can say that there is no recorded history of any painted dog ever attacking killing or harming a human and so, you know, my guess is that they were fairly separate um, because the dogs are, given, if given a chance, they're fairly reclusive and so um, kind of unto themselves. So I don't know anything. About, I've never heard of any, like, mythology or sort of, like, spirit animal kind of thing that I would know about maybe lions or hyenas. And I can only sort of guess at the fact that, you know, I doubt there was a ton of um, conflict between humans before right. they start. You know, before they started keeping livestock, the dogs would have had really no effect. And an, another another question before we go to um, before we go to, to to the wind down is, uh, you know, wolves have a really iconic sound, and so do coyotes. And many canids do. Do do painted dogs? Uh, do they do they make noise? Do they? What's they their sound? Do. They in fact they have lots of vocalizations. Um, they they use this who call to try to call each other. And I remember the first time my husband saw them in the wild, he he was saying, "What's that bird?" And it wasn't a bird; it was them. They they make a sound kind of against the ground which carries really far and which attempts to unite them with the rest of their pack. If, say, half of them are out hunting somewhere and half of them are out hunting somewhere else or for some reason they've been, um, they've lost each other in some way. So they make this, this call to reunite themselves. And it really, I guess it does kind of sound like a bird. I wish I could um, imitate it for you, but I know you can find it on, uh, on Google. Um, well, the the every every interview has the sound of a non-human at the beginning and end. So we'll do painted dogs for this one. Excellent. So people can hear it. Excellent. Um, they also make so, a lot of smaller sounds when they're when they're greeting each other. It's like um almost like a whimpering kind of sound, um and kind of like squeaking and high pitched sounds um, before they hunt or whenever they reunite. Each dog greets each other dog. And so um, before they hunt, you know, when they wake up and they get up and they start stretching and they start playing with each other, and they make this very sort of high-pitched, excited sound as they run around and sort of get themselves amped up. Um, one researcher I know calls it a pep rally. And so they have this sort of joyous little ceremony before they take off to go hunting. So that's another really cool sound that they make. They sound like such just such wonderful, wonderful creatures. Um, so, okay, short term, we know that the long term that they're declining. How about in the last five years? Are the, are the populations rebounding at all? Are they continuing to plummet? What's what's the short term uh, trend? For what we know, and again, they're tremendously difficult to track, and I'm sure there's packs that you know researchers have not found yet. Um, for what we know, I would say it's at a more or less sort of balance level um, so you know things another thing that happens is that uh, water holes get poisoned it's a really easy way to to poach elephants but then of course it also affects other animals that might drink from that water hole 
So there's sort of these, I would call them catastrophic, catastrophic pack events where either rabies will go through a pack, snares will kill a pack, distemper will kill a pack, you know, um, it, it's almost like an all or nothing thing. On the other hand, you know, they are finding new packs and I think people are, um, in Africa are becoming um, motivated to help save them and then I think that, you know, um, they have a certain tourist value which is helpful and I do know that whenever um, Whenever it's a kind of a safari concession where there's, you know, guides and, and tourists and, you know, concession operators who are inhabiting a place for the purpose of seeing wildlife, it's a really, it's a much safer place for wildlife to live. And so sort of as long as safari is something that people do and that, you know, concessions can keep up, those areas really do end up being places where these guys can thrive. Um, so short term, I would say, like where we are right now, I think it's sort of kind of out of balance, but that that new den disturbance um, sort of threat that I mentioned is something that really stands to change that and put it um, back into a more even negative. <clears throat> Um, I interviewed somebody a while back about koalas and somebody else about wombats. And in both of those cases, one of the um, things that makes their recovery difficult is that they are such, they're, they're very slow reproducers. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's one advantage that these dogs have with 10 to 12 pups. And do they have one, one litter a year or they typically have one litter a year. It is possible if it's a great year for prey and they're they're really successful that the alpha male might breed with more than one female, and so they might end up with even more pups. The alpha female will still raise them initially, and then of course the pack will raise them as they get older. But um, so it's possible to have more. It's also possible to have less. I mean, if you have you know a really small pack of dogs, let's say two to Five, yeah, they can probably only really take care of maybe four to five pups, and so it's it's seasonal. It's based on food abundance, you know, and the size of the pack, too. Well, it's it sounds like that if they are um, left alone with plenty of prey, that they actually can recover pretty quickly. Yes, I think so. And in fact, Dr. Rasmussen believes that you know if you took let's just say a, a, a captive population and put them out in the wild, that it is entirely possible that they can thrive. So um, when, you know, another idea that, that people have had is to, uh, to kind of avoid the inbreeding problem is to pick up packs and move them. And actually the dogs are quite happy if you took you know, nine dogs, a nine dog pack, and put them in one big cage and drove them to another part of Africa that they were somewhat familiar with, you know, they would probably thrive. And it is it is possible that, that it could be dealt with in that way. So I think they are a very resilient species. They're certainly very capable of taking care of themselves. Um, and so, you know, preserving habitat for them and then giving them, you know, wildlife quarters where they can connect with animals that don't share their gene pool is is really key to allowing them to try to come back. So we have about three or four minutes left, and um, I guess I have two final questions. And so one of them is, so um, if if they made you the 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 queen of all things painted dog, and you could. Uh, implement policies to help them and you can't like bring down capitalism you still have to maintain <laughs> you know the, the the general social structure what policies would you want to see implemented that's the first question and the second question is um what um what can people people who listen to this are mainly in the united states what can people in the united states do to help your efforts and more broadly help the painted dogs okay um, well, so as policies go, there is one little problem that dogs have, and that is that they're not actually um, protected by CITES. 
And so I don't really know why that is. I've never gotten a very good answer on that. But um, they need all of the protections that they can, can get, obviously. Um, once, you know, once they're to a certain level, you know, like some of the wolves in North America, it's very, very, very different, difficult to recover them. And so in terms of policies, I think they should be included. And then also, um, I guess, you know, I, if I was the queen of all things, um, I would actually consider all things because, you know, we as uh, conservationists tend to focus on an animal. And I think the painted dog is a great animal to focus on because they cover so much habitat and they're so interdependent or in, you know, communication with so many different animals. But, you know, saving painted dog habitat would also save habitat for giraffes and lions and all sorts of other things. And I think that we need to start to consider things on a ecosystem rather than just on a species basis because they're all interrelated and if they start to fall off different animals start to fall off then of course they all suffer for that and if habitat isn't available then of course they all suffer for that too so I guess my argument would be for a very integrated approach to wildlife conservation in Africa and everywhere but um I guess the other thing I would say is just respect. Um, and I, maybe that's one of the ways that you know people, uh, even here in the U.S., can help. Um, when people go on safari, they are the boss. And if they ask a guide not to do something, they probably won't do it. So I think being aware of the harm that it does to go into den sites is really important. And I, you know, I would hope that people would understand that dilemma and then sort of convey their choice not to do irresponsible things on safari. That would be another thing. Um, and then I guess speaking a little bit about what my organization does in particular, um, a big part of our mission is to increase awareness. And so one of the ways that we do that is by creating projects for local college students in STEM coursework to create technologies that help support our conservation efforts and then also hopefully give them real-world educational experience that can help them continue on in their careers. Um, our biggest project to date is the development of something that doesn't currently exist, which is a long-range affordable conservation drone. Um, our drone will actually um, link up to these tags on the dog's collars. And then once the drone locates a pack of dogs, it will be able to download information from those collars and return it to the researchers so that they can learn where the dogs are going, where they've been, right? They can, they can hopefully get more information. It's possible that this UAV could also carry a camera to see how many dogs are with the pack. Um, a lot of times, you know, the dogs will actually swim across the Zambezi River into Zambia and they are often met with a lot of snares on the other side. So um, it's really important to see where dogs are going, what's causing their loss, where you know things are safe, where things aren't safe. And so we're really hoping that this UAV can be um, deployed and used to help with tracking of these animals and also to help keep researchers safe and while they're doing that. Um, sea Shepherd here in Seattle, um, you mentioned Sea Shepherd earlier, is also looking at one of these UAVs, and we're actually building one for them too, where they would use the camera application to monitor marine life. So um, we're really excited about these projects because um, they, they give our students in STEM coursework a real leg up and you know, some really good experience to take forth into the world and also a real understanding of conservation and how they can be a part of it and how they can help. And I think that's, that's truly critical moving forward because I think everyone can play a role. Well, thank you so much for your work and thank you for being on the program.
and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Carrie Culp. This is Derek Jensen from Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.